Stanford University. Welcome to the final lecture of spring 2009-2010, E 380 I'm Andy Freeman. Um, for those of you taking the class for credit, please remember to complete all lecture reviews as soon as you can. We do not give incompletes. In addition, there are two course reviews. The mandatory one is on the E 380 website, and the registrar has a course review um, that if you complete it, they release your grades earlier. If you're graduating, this might be an important thing for you. Feedback, not review. Feedback, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, course feedback. Um, today's talk is about something that is about the $100 laptop and some of the associated infrastructure. This has become the default way for the computer industry to help people in developed countries. This is a somewhat curious default because the personal computer came after developed countries. So why is it a, pre a necessary precursor for de <laughs> new de uh, countries that are trying to develop now? It's not clear to me uh, that some robust mechanism for sharing and delivering uh, computational and communication systems into less developed areas would not be both cheaper and more likely to succeed. I mention that because the $100 laptop has been really, really, really hard. And you'd think it would be easy. It's just a cheap device. And we've gotten really good at making cheap devices. However, lots of smart people have flailed miserably. Today's speaker, Max Seibold, has come closer than most. We're going to see actual devices today. And he's also going to talk about how he plans to, deal, to make, let these devices communicate with the rest of the world, which is also important. Max. Good, a Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Max Siebold. And of course, we're talking about the $99 computer, not the $100 computer. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the invitation. Let me give you an overview of what we're doing and where we're going. And then hopefully, at the end, we will have enough time for questions and answers. So what do we do? Uh, we build uh, personal computers, and I will show you some more later. Um, our mission is really green computing for everyone. Um, the green basically stands for low energy consumption, but everyone, literally everyone, we were trying to reach a price point where we could address a much larger audience worldwide. I'll get to a little bit more details later, but basically right now the presumed um, number of users, internet users worldwide is 1.8 billion. Uh, lowering sub $100 uh, is assumed that another 2 billion people worldwide would be able to afford a laptop, which of course is a large market. I have I would say randomly copied you on two emails. The first one, coincidentally, I got in while I was pulling together the presentation. Someone from Indonesia, I don't know if you're able to read it, but basically someone says, um, um, uh, you can read it for yourself, we, uh, uh, laptops there are pretty expensive and they invited me to come and they need this kind of laptops there. We get hundreds and hundreds of this kind of emails from consumers, but even more so potential distributors and resellers all over the world who, I would say, caught the virus, really, in making green computing available for, for everyone. What is, what is that? Why doesn't this display? No. Let's switch to PowerPoint. This is very strange. 
using now I'm using an uh, <laughs> I'm using a ninety eight dollar Stanford lab uh, computer. That is really strange. So what I noticed earlier for some reason the graphics is not in there, but I think we can do it without. Okay. Um, so in terms of our geographic focus, um, this is the penetration of internet users worldwide. And um, our fo focus is exactly this, but in reverse order. <laughs> Meaning, basically, our main focus is basically bottoms up, um, Africa, Asia, and all the other countries. But let's also talk a little bit more about statistics, really, here. What's the truth in statistics? And it's almost like when you talk about unemployment. And you say, OK, unemployment is only 10%. Then, of course, the good news is 90 people are employed, but the bad news is 10% are unemployed. And for the, the ones unemployed, it's a very, very hard time. So even here in North America, I mean, the, the number looks great. But um, I mean, ballpark, 76% have access to the internet. But the bad news is still that 24% do not have access to the internet. One of the emails earlier, I didn't elaborate on it, the lower one, where it basically came from a customer in the US, and we also get many, many there, where people basically say, thank you for making a $99 computer available, because so far I wasn't able to afford one. Or people send emails and tell, this is the first laptop uh, in my life, and I'm now 54. Uh, so there are people also in industrialized countries um, that are first-time laptop users that fall into that kind of uh, price uh, bracket. So some more statistics. And I basically called it who is defining the future. The first statistic looked America, North America is really the dominating power, 76% per, uh, penetration already. But if you look at the actual users, really, the picture here is slightly different. Where Northern America only got uh, some uh, 260 million, whereas Asia is already at 764, at, if you remember, only 20% penetration. So multiply that by four or five, you'll get to a mind-boggling number over the years. So one step back again, we as Cherry Pell, we very much focus on developing countries. And I mean, we're very much on course here, because one of the major areas, really, where you find developing countries is in the driver's seat anyway. And that is basically Asia. So the market has changed. You might have noticed it. We're kind of um, in the middle of it. And I already mentioned that the fastest growing demand is actually in developing countries. Um, uh, penetration in, in Africa is only at 10% right now. And it's more than a billion people. And they will catch up very quickly in Asia anyway. The same is basically true for South America. What you have also probably noticed um, is basically, we call it, the media call it, basically the end of the Wintel assembly monopoly. Um, if you analyze the big three, four, five uh, PC vendors, uh, with an exception of one, uh, what they do is basically they take a processor from Intel, they put a Microsoft operating system on it, build a system around it, and that's it. So whether you buy brand A, B, or C, the user experience for you is basically more or less the same. You have a different logo on the box, but the, 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 the system itself um, is more or less the same because it's Intel-based, and there is a Microsoft operating system on it. The evolution here is basically 
and that's also very much driven by developing countries, that customers don't want a system anymore. They want an appliance, where basically the on and off button becomes the most important thing. And if you take a uh, little cherry pal, that's pretty much what it is. Basically, you have an on and off button, you turn it on, basically it boots up, if it's uh, pre-configured uh, um, uh, appropriately, you're already connected to the internet, the browser starts, and that's basically your user experience. There is no need to install any additional applications. It's already there. There is no need for additional virus software uh, because it's an embedded system. There is uh, no need for that. So from a, so the, the scope here basically changed that people, customers, consumers worldwide, but again driven by developing countries, very much care about the user experience as such. So the buying decision is not by a system with a Wintel and a Microsoft on it. It's basically um, how much does it cost and what can I actually do with it? When I turn it on, what happens? And the user experience is basically defined by the combination hardware, software, and services. Also, from a design, I would also say electrical engineering perspective, more and more you're basically forced to understand the entire world. It's not just good enough anymore to understand one piece of it, only hardware, only software. It's really a, a holistic system. And of course, uh, what has also changed over the years, um, social networks um, made distribution strategies more difficult or at least different. Meaning you can pump uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into TV ads, um, but in peer-to-peer -peer networks, on, on social networks, people form their opinion. And it's not that they're in particular nice to you necessarily, but basically they form an opinion whether it's cool or not, uh, whether you should buy or not. And so it has taken a completely different momentum here. And the interesting, um, shall I say, aspect here is it's not just in the industrialized world, it's very much so in, um, in developing countries as well, uh, where the word spreads, um, um, People text message each other basically what they should buy and many of it uh, basically bypasses the traditional um, communication channels. So the market has changed and um, as we call it, many others call it, um, the design principles are changing. They have already changed and they will change even more dramatically. And you might have read about it. Um, um, it's now basically called um, the good enough approach, really. It's not about the fanciest system. It's basically, what do I really get for my money? And of course, driven by the economic worldwide crisis, good enough is really the new booming thing, really where most consumers, not just in developing countries, also in the States, basically, and not just when it comes to buying a computer or a laptop, uh, go for good enough. What do I get for my money? Um, from a design principle perspective, also, when you design uh, such a system or an appliance, um, people are not that crazy anymore about the technical specifications, how many gigahertz and hyperthreading and all these other kind of things are in there. It basically comes back to, what if I open it and I turn it on, what can I actually do with it? What do I get for my money? It's not, you know, like uh, consumers have been trained here um, in this world, but also, let's say, if you look at uh, car commercials, you know, it's all about horsepower and other kind of things. And of course, it's cool driving 420 uh, um, horsepower on a 65 uh, mile per hour highway. Um, it's kind of surprising that the consumers still haven't figured out that uh, it kind of doesn't work. Um, but anyway, so consumer is less about this 
boring technical details, really, how many gigahertz. It's really more, what can I really do with it? And one of the influences here, I would really say, is also coming from the cell phone movement, really, where more and more these devices became much smarter, and nobody really knows, uh, or only few, what are really the technical specs behind your cell phone. It's basically you turn it on, you see your browser, so to speak, and then you do your stuff. Um, sure. No, this was only the PC market. It seems to me that cell phones are really the device that most people in the world use to connect to the internet at this point. Well, but uh, this particular statistic uh, was basically for, for, the, for the PC world, yeah. But it, it's a good question, yeah. Um, the next one is a little bit mis misleading, but I did that on purpose, really. It's a myth of uh, the, the cheap Chinese hardware. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one of our top three support calls before people actually buy is the question, um, is your stuff so cheap because you manufacture in China? And it's kind of hard to give a polite answer to it because the most truthful and direct and straightforward answer would be everyone manufactures in China. And whether... and um, we also re received, surprisingly, a lot of calls where people basically wanted to discuss with us since they learned that there were these suicides of this, uh, working for this contract manufacturer uh, for Dell, HP, and Apple, where they basically expressed their frustration that they learned that these are not American products, that these are actually Chinese products. And um, we Truthfully, I told these people, it doesn't matter where it's basically coming from. And again, side note, everything is coming from there. It's basically uh, 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 about quality and all these different kind of things. So in terms of design, really, and also in terms of uh, communication to the outside world, there is no such thing anymore as manufacturing in other kind of places. It is China and period. So why not more proactively put that into the entire design principles where still some companies are basically trying to artificially package it somewhere else so they can then uh, slightly change the label. I don't think there is any need for that. It is what it is and it is, it is manufactured in China. Um, design principles also from a consumer perspective is, is the so-called perceived quality. In the traditional manufacturing world, you again run your statistics and you basically say, I manufacture 100,000 of them and 1,000 break and that's pretty good and my target is no more than 1,000 can break and that sort of thing. This is not exactly how we and others are designing it in order to bring costs down. Um, we call it uh, perceived quality and this is basically when you give one a consumer and they work on it, again, it's about booting up other kind of things. It's about what's their experience with the battery, um, what if it breaks, how easily can they exchange it. It's really the perceived quality of it. And I give you another example there. If you buy a car for $80,000 and you get in the car as the new proud owner and it smells like plastic and it feels like plastic, the perceived quality then is pretty low because for that kind of money you want something higher standard. And of course in theory you could do exactly the opposite where you could basically put a lot of leather and other kind of things in a very, very inexpensive car and you would then ask the consumer and they would perceive the quality as relatively high. So for us it is a combination. It's not just that basically it is high quality, but it is also for our mostly first-time buyers that the quality is perceived as high. Um, last but not least, on this page here is um, what we call fancy is out. And what that really means is basically focus on things that, computer, that, uh, that uh, customers really need and not over-package it with things that drives the cost up and it looks cool but it doesn't help anyone. For example, 
I mean, you can put 10 USBs and FireWire and all different kind of things in there. And uh, I mean, there was a trend for a while, and you'll still find a lot of vendors that are completely, you know, armored uh, with all different kind of uh, plugins. And again, it becomes a part of the statistics where we don't offer that. We don't offer VGA for that reason because most of our users don't use it or rarely use it. And if someone really needs it, you can relatively inexpensively get an external adapter and, uh, and use it as well. It's basically non-fancy. It is really what does the average user need and you put that in and that's basically it. So it looks a little bit odd because the logo is missing, but um, anyway, it's better than nothing. So what are our design principles? And um, I'll try to make it brief. Um, we're all driven by price. Our target audience, again, are um, uh, developing countries as well as uh, low-income groups in uh, industrialized countries. Um, we analyze the market. We set a price. We define the user experience, and we define the perceived quality. Um, on that basis, then, we design a system, and we see if we can do it for the price. If we can, we do it. If we cannot, we won't do it. Uh, we're not a meet too. We're not trying to come up with the same system someone already developed. Uh, and just put another label on it. Um, if we cannot do it much, much cheaper, we won't do it. So um, it's a price and uh, use experience quality. Then we have different options, and I'll also get to that in a little while. We have different options uh, in terms of what we actually put in the board, how, what kind of horsepower we put in it. We have a pretty good experience now with... Uh, system on chip design, embedded Linux, and other kind of things. And again, we really don't care how many megahertz or gigahertz are driving it. It is all driven by the user experience. We build a prototype. We put it in front of, an, um, uh, of a focus group. Um, we let them guess. We let them decide if they like it or they don't. If they do, we do it. Um, just by the way, um, that's actually how we came up with the name Cherry Pell. I have to tell that quickly. Um, um, and it actually, I mean, it didn't take pl place here at Stanford University, but it was with a group of uh, Stanford uh, students a um, little bit more than two years ago, where we had actually built a prototype, um, and I'll get to the m more extended story later, a prototype of our desktop and uh, the, the design challenge was really to build an extremely energy efficient uh, desktop computer connection to the cloud, that sort of thing. And uh, we wanted to bring it below to what's what we actually did. So we didn't have a name, but we showed basically, and, and Debian Linux uh, runs on it, and we showed basically how you can browse and access emails and stuff. And um, one guy in the audience really yelled out loud and said, wow, that's sweeter than an apple. And then someone else said, um, that would be a cherry. So we kept the cherry, actually. And since we're your friend, then we added the, the pal to it. So that's why we're uh, cherry pal. Um, so s system on chip, uh, very small. Is it literally one chip? Or how many chips totally are in this? Your PC board? Uh, it depends. I mean, we have uh, we have different models, but we pretty much in the in the very first one, and um, I just mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, there's no no moving parts or anything in it, and I don't know if it's still up or it got ever posted. We had this fun thing going on where we actually played tennis with it because it's basically just a little board with uh, a chip and a couple of connectors on it. And we played tennis with it and wanted to demonstrate how robust it is. And it actually worked later, and it did. And we never tried it with the other cherry pelts, but I'm pretty sure they would work as well. So it's um, here is basically a tri-core processor in it, uh, very, very efficient. And then basically the, 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 
the NAND flash drive uh, in a couple of connectors, and that's basically it. I mean, it looks very lonely in here. Um, okay, so um, the, uh, the principle here is really low power consumption, as few co components uh, as possible. We have one exception for our Africa model where we also put Windows CE on it. Uh, due to market demand, in particular in, in, in Africa. We don't spend a lot of time in terms of uh, the form factor itself. Um, you might consider it ugly or reasonable or pretty or whatever. Um, whatever your assessment is, uh, it's a coincidence. Uh, or, or an act <laughs> um, um, our only selection and design criteria here is basically f following um, the idea of form follows function um, uh, the highest possible quality and as long as it looks reasonably okay um, we're not willing to spend a single literally nickel more for any kind of fancy design um, quality control is pretty much integrated in the design of it which is very important to us meaning um, we learned our lesson in the beginning. We had problems with batteries, as an example. We shipped them. Uh, batteries are very hard to test, and we found out later. So we're only using components now, which we can completely QA. And our goal, and we're pretty close, is that we have a zero defection rate when we ship it. Um, when it goes to Africa and other kind of countries, also, we have local partners there, but you really want to make sure that you're shipping uh, a good product. And again, most of our customers are first-time users, and we don't want them to experience the frustration. Uh, and it's actually not more expensive doing it really that way. You just have to design it that basically the framework um, is really quality control. I mean, it's not, not just something you do somewhere in the middle and somewhere at the end. It's really an essential part of the entire process. So, make a long story brief, what are our cost advantages? Um, we strongly believe it, it, is, it is our design methodology um, and um, um, it's a lean system on chip design, uh, of, of course. I mean, otherwise it, 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 it wouldn't be possible. Um, very important here is also just to pick a couple of random points, otherwise it could talk forever about it. Um, low power consumption is not just good for the environment. It's also very good, I mean, in terms of building lasting devices, as you probably know. Uh, power equals heat exposure. Heat exposure really equals to a, n a number of other problems, really. And um, we believe that our devices will s live uh, beyond uh, the average of uh, traditional personal computers. Just the heat exposure is, uh, is, is relatively low. And of course, it's saving us um, cost in the manufacturing process as well. Um, we as a company have a uh, very, very low administrative uh, overhead. I would also say it's built that way and we will keep it that way. And um, um, uh, smart distribution is basically, I mean, if you see our prices, what well, that basically means we don't spend anything in marketing, literally. Uh, we use social media, we use uh, we let uh, media write about it, good things, bad things, ugly things. Surprisingly, the worse the news is, the more orders we get in. So uh, it doesn't stop uh, customers, really. Um, this is what we launched end of the year. And I have uh, a model here just to give you an idea. It was basically the first uh, $99 computer. 7-inch uh, RM9 based, single processor, 266 uh, megahertz. Uh, if we put CE on it, it's $19 more. Um, uh, on Linux basis, it's $99. And it's basically browser um, uh, a number of uh, Office productivity, including Word, PowerPoint, uh, the, the usual Microsoft products, uh, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and 3G is optional. Um, and I can only say it was a huge success worldwide, 
but also in the States, which really, really caught us by surprise. The 3G is optional. We're working with a number of. Uh, oh, the, the Wi-Fi and Ethernet are, are included. They're all included. Yes, that's included in the in the price. Absolutely. Yeah. Then um, three weeks ago, um, we decided to give Android a shot. Um, we have uh, a seven-inch and a ten-inch. Um, and it's a little bit stronger processor. Um, basically, uh, for the seven inch, for the same price. And um, you can install any Android applications you want. And here, it's absolutely not clear, I have to admit. So, so uh, Wi-Fi is included. Uh, there's no Ethernet anymore because, again, in order to get rid of the fanciness, most people don't use Ethernet anymore. They just have access to Wi-Fi. So we basically, um, in order to save cost, we dropped it. And 3G is optional. It's basically the same thing. You'll see that from a number of telcos all over the world basically offering their devices uh, basically as a mobile device uh, prepackaged. Very low power, low cost device. How many people go for the three G extra hundred dollars a month for their wireless bill, like kind of thing? Is it incredibly cheap for three G in Africa, or is this just like vastly more expensive than the device itself? Okay, it's it's a, it's a good story, and I don't mind answering it. Um, What's happening there right now is, I mean, really high level, and uh, of course, in every country, it is it is different there. But for example, what's very popular there, and I wanted to show you something else, uh, so you really see our non-fancy approach. And if you're trying to figure out what kind of uh, laptop that is, I have to disappoint you. It's actually a solar charger. Um, what we mostly developed for for Africa, and the only unique thing here is again really the price point we will first ship it to Africa and then later in the year also make it available to the US and the retail price is way below $50 and you can in real time charge a little laptop computer as well as for example a 3G router and here is the answer to the question what um, what people there are doing in Africa as well as in Asia um, for example churches they buy it in bulk they put a 3G router uh, in a church, and they basically share the connection with 250 of their fellow members. So they're using like a Wi-Fi point. Yes. Share. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How much they charge? How much they cost a month? I don't know, but it's very low. It due to it's, it's yes. basically most of the time in Africa, um, so they use it just as well as the, the cell phone providers use it to provide internet as well. And the cost of it is almost as much as people use on minutes on their phones. Um, again, this is a, uh, and then you have um, countries or particular areas where, for example, um, the, 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 the World Bank or the UN funded really nice projects like, for example, um, WiMAX coverage. Uh, where there's a better infrastructure than it is here, and where now governments are really trying to motivate people um, uh, to buy laptops and to use the infrastructure. Um, I just had a conversation with a large, or I believe the largest telco in India this morning, where there is now a program in India where the government subsidizes first-time laptop buyers with $100, which is nicely in our sweet spot, <laughs> plus um, $15 a month subsidy for the uh, 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 communication uh, expenses. Um, in general, there are a lot of governments all over the world, predominantly in developing countries. They are subsidizing, really, this kind of efforts. Um, I mean, if a laptop costs $500, $600, $700, a subsidy of $100 doesn't change the entire rule. But if they get it next to free or for half of it, 
Um, and then they're also in some countries or through some partners micro loans where they pay through us two or three dollars um, a month basically to pay off their $99 computer over uh, two or three years then all of a sudden it's uh, it's, it's affordable from a hardware perspective I mean, uh, Wi-Fi is simple. I mean, that's in there, and that's very inexpensive uh, to get now. Um, I mean, without getting lost in any kind of details, but it's basically in terms of our bomb cost, it's like three dollars and fifty cents. Um, the second question was three uh, G. That depends on the manufacturer and everything, but that adds about another ten to twelve dollars. That no, that's basically our price. End customer is 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 really uh, up to our partners, and uh, and it pretty much depends whether there are um, import duties and that sort of thing. But um, usually our partners are pretty good. I mean, if we set a price, they mark it up by a couple of percent. And uh, so it's still very, very inexpensive there. Um, since we pursue open communication, and I mean, the word is out anyway. Um, so we started out with the um, Cherry Pell uh, Africa and then uh, Cherry Pell Asia. Um, a question on the last two slides. Pardon me? Question on yeah. the last two slides. Sure. Languages are you guys supporting in those in those two different models? I didn't catch the first part. Which languages are you providing support for? Languages in the sense of programming languages? No, well, interface first. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, the the Linux works in a way. It basically goes to the partner, um, and the partner basically puts the local language on it. Uh, the Android version is uh, not in every language is available. One example, for example, our partner in Lao in, uh, in Asia is translating uh, Android in Lao language uh, as we speak. But it's actually a good transition over to the next model. Um, we actually started working conceptually on tablets long time ago and probably for different reasons than other companies are doing it here for the US. The huge advantage for us, for us in terms of a tablet, um, there is no physical keyboard. So it's very, very easy to adjust it to local languages. And we have um, markets, I mean, if you, for example, look into India, uh, where, of course, most people understand English, but you also have uh, um, a lot of um, parts there where people prefer their local languages or even local dialects. As far as, far as I remember correctly, there are 14 different languages in India, and they're not directly related to each other. Plus, you have 70, 60 very unique dialects, really. So the desire, really, of our partners there is to provide a device to their customers where they're most comfortable with. Um, and that's pretty much in their local language. So all this open source operating environment, so to speak, um, you can tr translate that. And that's basically, for the most part, what, um, what our partners do. So you're going with Unicode as the character set? Yes. Um, and just uh, if you want to touch and feel the little one, we have that um, already here. Um, so this is the slide where I have to be very careful that I'm, n n that I'm not getting lost because here I could really talk for hours. And this is really a little bit about, I would say, understanding what we're doing really better. Uh, where we're coming from, but also where we're going and understanding the evolution in our industry. Um, you can see here, it's called Consumer Cloud Computing 2008. 
meaning we came up with this more, more than two years ago. And again, it was actually the very beginning of Jerry Pal, where the idea was really this project around what is cloud computing? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there were these ideas. I mean, you, you do Yahoo Mail, Google Mail, YouTube, all these other kind of things. All is, ho all is hosted. Is this cloud computing? Can you integrate these kind of things closer? Um, by now, we give them all different labels, but the ideas are still pretty much the same. So we, together, actually, with predominantly one semiconductor company, um, came up with this 10-layer um, architecture. You could also call it a solution stack, where it basically says you take a very inexpensive processor and you put a highly uh, optimized embedded Linux on it. Step one, and you can have several of them. Step two, if one is not good enough, you can take more of them and um, you find a way to synchronize um, um, load balance or you basically give them different purposes like, for example, in our world w with heavy graphics, um, it makes sense to have a dedicated processor really for, for that. Um, I don't want to talk too much about uh, device drivers. I think that's pretty clear. Um, then in this environment, there are different uh, browsers. Two years ago, we mostly had uh, Firefox. Um, now more and more um, Google Chrome is used. Um, but in general here, um, we have our, our own ideas and we have made our own changes. The trend here is basically that browsers become smarter and smarter, or as some of them call fatter and fatter. Um, w basically, in order to take over some of the workloads that would have otherwise um, happened um, up in the hosted environment. So that's kind of uh, a moving target here. Um, then, of course, you have uh, the local applications. Um, you will see architectures like Google Chromium OS, and we're also working on that, where you hardly find any local applications anymore. But again, this is a solution stack. It can be packaged in different ways. Most parts of the world, in particular, where you don't have um, internet connection uh, 24 by 7, you still very much need uh, local applications. Then, of course, you have the connection of the actual hardware, the appliance to the, to the cloud. And, of course, you have um, Wi-Fi, 3G, and all the other kind of things. Th the main reason why we have given it its own layer here is really the weakest link in the entire story is actually security uh, between uh, the actual hardware and the host environment. And actually, even two years ago, in our little one, we abused one core of the processor and uh, basically used it as a uh, hardware encryption device. So um, it's actually defense-grade uh, connection from um, our, uh, for we called uh, C100, uh, uh, and then 120, basically up to the cloud. It's hardware encrypted, and that's what we believe um, is the way to go um, in the future anyway. Then you have in the host environment the cloud architecture itself. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it. Then you have the cloud applications and, uh, and services. Um, what nowadays, um, just to synchronize, most people refer to as application store. And um, since two years ago, hardly any consumers really understood what we we're talking about. Uh, and media frequently mix it up that they basically accused us that the operating system would run in the cloud and people wouldn't have access to it anymore. We're keeping our basic architecture and we will continue to build it out. But the way we label it, um, and we'll see it later, is now also completely different. Um, layer 8 is a very interesting one. Um, could almost call it a, a pet child or so. 
Um, we have made major progress is really in building inexpensive hardware. Hardware in the sense of internet access devices. But what about, um, it's a part of the entire story, what about the data centers? Hardly anything has changed there. And um, make a long story brief, also in close cooperation with a semiconductor company, we built a prototype where we took really, really inexpensive uh, processors um, and basically gridded and clustered them uh, and basically see what the outcome was and the energy consumption was incredibly low and pretty fast and um, we didn't have the money and the bandwidth really to pursue it aggressively but this is definitely on our radar screen um, um, in order to make it also available to our partners developing countries that should be a fairly easy one to build that out and apply similar design principles, really call it to uh, um, um, data center architectures. Last but not least, nine, in order to make the story complete. Cloud nine? Uh, cloud nine, exactly, <laughs> that's cloud nine. Uh, what we call super cloud architecture um, is basically, we believe we live in an open world. So when you build out your cloud or application store, you shouldn't artificially create another island or silo. So we strongly believe that the different kind of clouds or application stores should uh, be able to communicate with each other. And um, what we're going to see from us, uh, uh, latest by Q4 of this year, is basically when you connect, you connect into what we call your home store. So if you're in the States, it's going to be the home store in the States. If you live in Nigeria, it's going to be the one in Nigeria. But you can already smell a little bit of the super cloud architecture, where then basically from Nigeria, you can then also um, um, load applications that are in other stores from other um, Cherry Pell partners um, in the world. But um, without wanting to step on anyone's toes, but we believe it should be open that also a Cherry Pell uh, customer can, can um, download applications from an, from an Apple store or a Google store and vice versa. Uh, I think that's how the world should work uh, as, as, as open as possible. Yes? In your device, it has the Microsoft XP inside? Um, <laughs> Well, it's an embedded, it's really an embedded version. Um, we have one exception. Um, we have um, one model r runs XP or Windows 7, uh, which we still do because there is market demand. We just do it cheaper than others, and that's basically our Bing model. But all the other, but it's not exactly addressed for, uh, let's say, the 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 developing world or, or, or cloud architecture. It's basically where we just like all the other Wintel box assemblers basically put the system together and we just sell the same thing a little bit cheaper than others. So that's XP or Windows 7. But this is uh, Windows CE, which is basically an embedded, lightweight, mini XP. And uh, the customer need pay the sort of oil. I mean, in your device have software inside, and the customer pay one hundred dollars. Mm. Then most of the money is to buy the software or buy the hardware. Okay, um, you pay a hundred dollars. You push a button. You find a hotspot. Go to McDonald's, uh, and it works. No, I mean in the one hundred dollars. Portion. I mean, how, many, how, how much percentage pay for the CE? You know, you have, you have CE uh, if you want CE? No, I mean, how much? The $100, how much money pay for the software? How much money pay the hardware? For the whole $100? Uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,
It's very popular in Africa, and that's why we basically do it. Um, um, I'm sure that's changing over time, but it's basically <laughs> ni $19 uh, for, 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 for the license, yeah. What is it that drives the popularity of uh, the It's... Um, it's translated it's from the language? Familiarity to the, um, people, that's what, from the beginning. When people were still computers, it was, it was, you know, it was uh, Microsoft. So that's what people, well, it was Windows, so that's what people still uh, are familiar with. When you say something like Linux, I mean, to older generation or people who would who, who buy this, it's a bit tend to. It's know. a cultural thing. Yeah. But, but Windows C is not at all like Windows. I mean, it is. It, it, I mean, it is and it isn't. I mean, um, the user experience here, which is actually an advantage and a disadvantage, but the user experience here is really, it's very hard to add or delete anything. So it's basically, <laughs> it comes with these applications. <laughs> it, it comes with these applications. And it's almost, I would say, foolproof, really. It works. So you can't screw up the system. There is not much to update. There's nothing to update. I mean, it's, it's Windows CE 6.0. I mean, there are hardly any new releases or anything. But it works, right? Um, the, the, the read, also talking to partners, is really um, people in Africa, I mean, a huge buying group, of course, are high school and college students and they are familiar with the term Microsoft, and they basically say, okay, if I get a much, much better system, then I pay $19 more. Um, and we don't want to push them, basically, well, open source and this and that. This is something over time where the word will spread. What I can already say is with, um, with Android now, it's slightly different because people heard about that it runs on cell phones and it's a relatively pleasant user experience. The problem here is really Linux got a bad perception really from a consumer perspective. You've got to be a geek and it's only for experts. Uh, it's too difficult for an average consumer. That is basically when people hear Linux and that's also true in the States. Many of them shy away. It's different with Linux, and of, uh, with Android, and as we all know, Android is Linux-based as well. Um, but it's, again, it's not about facts. It's about perception. security flaws found in Windows CE, what's your sort of patch and update mechanism? From an uh, architecture perspective, and of course, again, that's a three or four hour discussion, but from an architecture perspective, um, and there has been, have been many articles and any th lots of stuff around it, whenever you're able to embed something, really, you can pretty much harden it, really, and make it virus safe. The problem with XP and all the other kind of systems is really that they're built up in different kind of layers and they're not embedded, that it's fairly simple uh, to get in from, uh, from outside. So, I mean, the, 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 the advantage of CE is really it is embedded. And em embedding a system is a proven, simple technology. However, from a, from a manufacturing perspective, if you build a system, uh, and let's just take it as an example, XP, you want to put that on many different processors, right? Whereas if you embed something, it's basically the one code just for this particular processor. Um, and that's also why we have that here as a particular layer in there. Um, we're even optimizing that even further. It's really code that is just for this particular processor but really getting the most horsepower out of it. The same code for a slightly different processor doesn't work. Do you, do you not think that perhaps hardwiring things like the browser or encryption will actually, might actually make it more difficult to address security flaws? Like if 
security flaws are found in Chrome, or you use SSL and there's a security flaw in the algorithm that's actually implemented correctly, do you find that because it's embedded and hardwired, it might, or do you suspect or consider a danger that, that, that this hardwiring and embedding might actually make it? I mean, knock on wood, and I hope it's real. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, ca I can truly say we, we shipped a lot of units so far, and we did not have any feedback related to it. Whereas I al also have to say the, the only support issue we have with the Bings is really that we sometimes run into production batches for our contract manufacturer where it's an additional feature, they, they already come with viruses on it. And we're not the only, <laughs> then, I, mean, I mean, all of them struggle with it, where it's, um, uh, it's, it's really hard to deal with. Uh, but um, let me really make a long story brief. I think the world is going the embedded way because it is really the best way to get the, the most bang for your bucks, really. Um, but also to harden the system, really. Um, also in terms of hardware encryption, I, I mean, whenever something is software encrypted, it's a question of time till some kind of genius figures it out. But if you really encrypt it on a, on a hardware basis, it's much, much more difficult. And you can really do it as, that it's next to impossible because you would need the actual hardware for it. Okay, the CE, CE, this, this software, this operating system can process the world, the world. Like well, yes. it, it comes pre-installed with, um, with a lightweight version of Word, but something what feature set, what most people use, I mean, I don't use the fancy stuff anyway in Word, uh, but I mean, it's, it's a Word. And then th you, can do, you can do PowerPoint, you can do um, Excel spreadsheets, then there is a PDF reader. I mean, the usual stuff, including an uh, instant messaging system. Um, we, I mean, the, the only complaint is that we couldn't load Skype on it. It works on the Android version, but it doesn't work on the CE version. And that's very popular, as you can imagine. Um, but again, I mean, the, the strength of the system and really from a first user perspective, is there's not much you can break. It, it works. Any kind of attempts to make changes fail, it works. Uh, and that's the power of the system, and for a reasonable price. Skype works on Linux? Uh, on Linux, very much so, yeah, it does. Cool. And, and Android as well. Okay. And any other company? competition with you, you made this cheaper device. Any other company in the world uh, competing with your company? Can we fail? Um, it's another story. Um, we launched the Africa um, December 15th. Okay, excuse me. Like the Taiwan the Acer. Taiwan Acer, they, they don't do that. They don't do this one? Well. No, 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 they don't do that. They're scared. Um, yeah, scared. <laughs> well, I mean, if you come back to, if you come back to basically, if we would turn that into a business model discussion, an emphasis is really, I mean, besides our very efficient supply and manufacturing process, we're a lean organization. So the markup is, 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 is very uh, low. Um, if you take uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100,000 uh, employee company um, <laughs> and take their overhead and factor that into it, I mean, I know for a fact in some cases where their overhead is higher per unit than our retail price per unit. Um, and that is just the, 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 the problem there. Um, I mean, we're getting a lot of hate emails from concerned people <laughs> They're scared, and I understand, losing their jobs because, I mean, they can add up the numbers too. And uh, they're basically accusing us to destroy an entire industry. And um, anyway, I mean, that's the uh, problem always with uh, technical process. Uh, 
Um, no, the, the, the story basically goes, um, and it's, 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 it's not a very funny story, but I have to tell it anyway. Um, so, so we launched it, and um, actually the first three containers that were supposed to go to partners were actually kidnapped by our shipping broker in, in, in Hong Kong. And he didn't ship it to customers, he basically turned them around and sold them in, uh, in China. Um, which was a huge financial loss for us. I mean, the funny side of it was, I mean, he still shipped, but he didn't ship laptops. He basically shipped all different funny things. And one of them was Chinese women's underwear, where, as you can imagine, our first set of customers were really surprised when they received laptops. They didn't receive laptops, but Chinese underwear. I mean, we replaced all of them, but it was really annoying. But the point was basic. The, the point I was trying to make <laughs> the point was basically these three container loads went into mainland China. And that's actually how we found out that we got so many, so many calls really from China, support calls, yeah. where people had all these questions. And then, of course, in the next wave, then customers called us and complained about their shipments. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but the, the, the market research there was really that, uh, I mean, China fully embraced what we had to offer, and they, they, they loved the price, and they loved the quality and everything. Well, the price was zero, so yeah, of course. They're uh, they're well, I'm they're sure they're the they're broker they're charged they're them something <laughs> for it. Um, we're aware that there are other vendors in China offering things for the similar price or even lower. Whereas we see the entire package, and considering the quality we provide, um, we believe we are in a very unique position here. But China, they do pretty good. I believe they do pretty good. Your system is quite fast. They have ability, very strong ability to immediately do pretty good your system and stay very cheap in China. So again, there is only one place where you do it anyway, and that is China. <laughs> so we're China too. I mean, I mean, we're a Chinese company too. They're already doing it cheap for him. Uh, so, so I mean, can you beat yourself? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why I'm basically saying. I mean, You're basically doing insider attack. Yeah. yeah. You should, you should yeah. Uh, are schools interested in this? Is the education system looking at this as a way to kind of? Augment classes system. Um, I'll get back to a question. I don't know how much time we have left. Yes, oh wow! Um, see, I, I knew that this was the dangerous slide, really. <laughs> okay. So how do how do we do all of this? And let me really quickly run through. Uh, and one of it, uh, I think, should answer your question. We have an um, uh, so-called exclusive country partner program. Uh, all over the world. Um, we have Kenya here, Wilson. Um, um, what we basically do here is um, we almost outsource, almost like franchise, basically hand over the keys for a particular area to a partner. Most of them have already pretty good infrastructure in place. They take care of uh, localization, uh, distribution channels, and, and everything. So we're really as local as possible. And we have numerous countries now in, um, in Africa as well as in, 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 in Asia. Uh, and we were holding back really with the industrialized world doing it uh, at a later point. Um, and they will also um, will franchise our basic, basically the, the local version of the application store to each of these different partners. Then we have a program called Edwin, Education Wins where we're pulling uh, a content provider for education together and uh, making that available to um, uh, NGOs all over the world, but also um, here in the US. And by the way, a lot of school districts um, um, already bought from us. Um, one of the initial partners for Edwin is a project, and it's, it's really cool. I mean, you should check it out. It's called the Big Huge Brain. It's kind of a correlation engine where you, I mean, they're coming basically from the legal discovery world and they're applying now this technology and have made it uh, available for free. 
basically to um, go through Wikipedia and not just in a way of traditional search, basically really trying to find uh, not just um, uh, content but also context, really. And uh, yes, and it really works. Uh, and the idea behind that is really to help uh, high school, college, university students to help with their papers to do a more thorough search. Um, another initiative is the Nairobi project uh, uh, going on right now, where we're working with eight um, college students in uh, Nairobi, uh, Kenya, where we're testing Google Chromium OS on a new device which hasn't been announced yet and basically optimizing it and um, then another one and you'll see it's a it's, it's a it's a mix and it's just, just of course a, a couple of samples um, it's a mix basically between sales related activities but also development related and it's very important for us that we do both and we also mix them because there is nothing more important than feedback basically from actual customers um, another one is the cherry pill cafe um, concept and we have the first pilot in uh, Los Angeles which is in a relatively low income neighborhood Inglewood just outside of the, the airport uh, where basically in a retail environment um, almost like it's, it's, it's a coffee shop where there's a free hotspot where you can go there where you can browse on um, um, the internet on a cherry pal and there is not much technical pre-sales consulting or so but it's almost like a, a, a Costco environment where basically there are boxes piled up uh, while you sip your coffee and browse the internet and if you like it you buy it. Uh, it's an inexpensive distribution channel which we are testing here and it's really going well and we want to copy that into other low-income neighborhoods in the States, but also copy the concept then in other parts of the world. So the area. Pardon me? Yeah, something around here? Um, it's just LA right now, but we, we will have uh, um, uh, something here as well. So coming back to the, t in a, uh, coming back to the 2008 overview, what you s saw the 10 layers, um, again, for the most part, it's still intact. The, the major changes today is really the labeling. Um, cloud computing, we believe, got replaced now by application store. Um, the, the user experience now is completely browser-based. Um, and it's the seamless integration to this um, home store, this localized uh, application store. And hopefully, for the consumer, um, we're not entirely in the driver's seat here, but hopefully for the consumer, they can choose between many. So why is the $99 uh, computer a revolution? Um, we believe opening a market of an additional 2 billion new customers, users, is a huge revolution. Um, we have also, purely from a technical perspective, proven that um, the market is willing to consume a laptop as an appliance and not as a system. And I elaborated uh, about that earlier. Uh, this is really where the market is going. What we're very proud of is that there is a proven correlation between internet access and education. There are tests in the US um, and again, we are working with a number of school districts where basically if you give a kid, um, middle school, high school, um, a computer access to the internet, their reading skills go up dramatically, even their math skills go up, uh, and it's really helping to improve their scores. On a worldwide basis also, there's a cor clear correlation between internet access and income opportunities. Just here in the States, I mean, if you don't have uh, computer access to the internet, uh, you can, can't even, to the best of my knowledge, file for unemployment benefits, nor can you send out um, uh, your resume or other kind of things. Um, but again, there's a, there's a correlation between internet access and uh, income <coughs> opportunities. And what's very important to us, really, from a really global picture, there's a correlation between internet, ac internet access and cultural tolerance, really. 
So the more we spread these additional devices for 2 billion new users, and they learn about what people really do and think here in the States and in Europe and other parts of the world, they might less hate us and vice versa. And there is a clear correlation, again, uh, foster cultural tolerance. So some quotes or statements uh, at the end. Um, the first one is actually top of the list in, our, in terms of our support calls, where people say, uh, Jerry felt cheated on me because my internet connection doesn't work. Um, in the beginning, it was a real problem. By now, we're a little bit smarter. And the tricky part here is really that a lot of people don't understand that when you buy an internet access device or a laptop, that it doesn't come with an internet connection. And it really, in some cases, took us a long time to figure that out. We're we had changed our website for a while and made that absolutely crystal clear. Then other people got mad at us and basically thought we were basically uh, considering them dumb, uh, that we uh, went into that great detail. But it, it is a problem. It is not just in North America. It is worldwide a problem that a lot of people still don't understand that. Uh, I mean, it is pretty well. I mean, it's, you, you need a you need an internet service provider, and I, I mean, the, um, again, uh, the large telcos all over the world are all over it, and um, I mean, it, it 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 will be an option pretty soon. But again, this is our support issue number one: that people get their shipment and the internet doesn't work. Um, Number two, a uh, real quote from um, um, a dad in Africa where he basically emphasized really on how important that is for him and his kids, where he said, I can live with less food, but I can live without a good education for my children. And um, he was very helpful then also in a particular region together with his church basically to set that up and uh, to get going. Um, the, the next one is from an actual customer in India, was one of the first ones who ordered it, and he basically, through his brother, ordered the, the, um, the unit. And what he's doing now, he's living in a remote village, and his business is basically to send and receive emails for the other members of his village, and then once a week, he basically travels back to the city where he can up and download emails. And he makes a good living. He sends me an email every week and tells me how business is doing. And I'm, 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 I'm very happy for him. Um, the next one um, is something where we only heard from customers here in the States, where people, where people basically said, your thing is so, so cheap. Uh, I don't have to travel with my expensive laptop anymore. Um, if I break a $99 device, who cares? So you are the first disposable laptop. Um, uh, all I can say is this is not what we built it for. <laughs> this is not what we wanted to accomplish. Um, it is, so the answer, of course, is here, of course, no. <laughs> but it's absolutely up to you. Um, how you want to use it. And of course, the last one, we discussed that before. Um, I like cherries very much, but of course, it's at the end a matter of taste. Um, thank you. Any questions? Uh, are you a nonprofit? No. Um, we're. No. Uh, the, we frequently get this kind of question, and I would say we're, we're a very much a for-profit organization with a non-profit value system. However, however, um, I strongly believe things like what we're doing, you can only manage that with really, really clear objectives, 
time for management uh, in a nonprofit environment, it, it, I don't see it working. No. You never mentioned uh, one laptop per child. You did. <laughs> Why didn't they succeed? Um, I was waiting for that because also everyone is asking me for that. Um, and I think it's a wonderful initiative. And I, I, I think they're, I, I hope they're doing well. Um, we know of each other and we're really hoping that we're not directly competing with them. Um, in terms of their success, I can't elaborate. Um, I, can, I, I can only say we are a for-profit organization analyzing the market demand and we also, by the way, believe in doing good things, but at the end of the day, it's business. And the business is basically there is a market, so we analyze it. We see if we can build a product for it. If we can, we, we build a product for it. Um, so we are not one laptop per child. We are one laptop for everyone. And so we're not really, um, or there is one, one project and it just got published. Um, um, we're working with um, Teachers Without Borders and they had a, we supported them in their project in, in Nigeria and now I think they're rolling it out into other countries and they basically gave it the, the title one laptop per teacher. Um, then we have another project which I personally think is very very interesting also in Africa where basically it's also a, a, a government sponsored project where every farmer gets a laptop and basically, depending where they are, and of course, uh, you can, based on the IP address and everything, find out where you're, you're uh, um, communicating from. Uh, anyway, they basically, for their crops and everything, they basically get instructions every day what to do. And it's supposed to be, or the beginning of it is very, very promising, very successful. Uh, so this is basically then one laptop per farmer. Um, but these are the kind of things, the kind of projects that we really like. And again, um, um, f for many parts of Africa, uh, although it's not the prettiest, but it really works, um, since we're laughing, um, it, it really only works for the most part of the developing world, b bundling the different things together. Power is the main problem. Um, we have a partner in Burkina Faso, and um, it's in the northern part. Um, and uh, their problem is they have only three to five hours per day of electricity. And there is basically, in order to keep some infrastructure going, uh, no other way than, than doing something like this. And many, how shall I say, more traditional solar chargers or solar systems are, are rather expensive. And again, our design principle here was only to come up with something that works and is fairly inexpensive. And I think, um, also it's not that pretty, but it's not that ugly either. Uh, but um, yeah, so I think One Laptop Per Child is a great initiative and uh, I'm sure they will do well. So you can like uh, Nokia is uh, sending a phone and then can talk. In the future, this? Yeah, I believe we also have the function like the cellular, cellular phone. No, I mean, I mean, what people are doing with it here is really um, there is Skype on it. There is Skype on it, and um, I mean, I mean, I mean, honestly, I think for a phone, it's a little bit too big. Um, But it's just, uh, I mean, it's basically as a Skype phone. And of course, there in other parts of the world, you'll find Skype-like systems as well. I mean, there are some others uh, more popular, actually, in, in, in Asia. Hey, another thing is, you, see, you say several times, some people hate your country. Hate, H-A-T-E, hate your country. It's like the, the, like the answer or something they hate. It. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, um, no, I mean, I mean, we're 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 getting a lot of hate emails naturally uh, for, for 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 different reasons, but 
I, I mean, it, it's also always giving you an opportunity to, to engage with people. And like, for example, um, one of the first countries in Africa where we did a lot of business with was Nigeria. And I mean, what I didn't know is whenever you mention the, the name Nigeria, then people here immediately assume, I mean, that you're a scam artist because, I mean, who deals with Nigeria? Uh, and and, and we're, we're hoping basically in our little global community that we get the point across that this is not the case, right? I mean, most people in Africa are very honorable people. Um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, people accuse us of something and then we address it and it's, yeah. Um, we can keep going, but I want to grab it. Yeah, sure. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.